<gasps> Record. Okay. Let's go. My name is Rob Weiss. I'm a therapist and I work uh, in sex addiction and intimacy disorders and lots of books, lots of treatment work. And Tammy and I have been doing this regular gig for a while now, just uh, answering questions for you guys. And um, we don't charge. We do a whole bunch of these activities all week long. It's my intention to be able to deliver some kind of support to those of you who may not make it to treatment, may not make it to a therapist, may not make it to a 12 step meeting, but we can offer this free. And, um, you know, when I was a younger man and I wanted to talk to professionals, it was very hard to get a hold of people who really knew what they were talking about or I didn't have the money for, to see them and all that. So I'm pretty proud of the fact that we can offer you experts at no cost to answer your questions twice a week and multiple times a week on the website. So that's why we're here. Um, I volunteer every week. So what are the questions you might be asking since you haven't started asking them yet? Okay. You might ask, um, uh, what is sex addiction? How do I heal from it? Is sex addiction really a thing? What do I do about porn? Um, how do I work through not hating my spouse anymore after they've ruined my life by cheating? These are the things we talk about here. We talk about cheating and infidelity and sexual acting out and how to heal relationships here a lot. Um, so we have questions. Okay, let's answer some. Is it ever appropriate to contact your SA husband's therapist or sponsor if you find proof that he is acting out? If not, how should you handle it? Well, that's a great question. Um, so there are two sides to this question, right? One is I don't want to be the spouse that is seen to be sort of this person's detective, right? And I don't want a, their therapist to think of me as someone who's running after them. Oh, oh, you didn't see this. But on the other hand, if they didn't see something, I think they need to see it. And I'm a spouse who worries, you know, it, you know, is everything being talked about in therapy? So this is what I would do. Um, I might write a little note uh, with your husband or, or spouse present and let them see what you're writing and say, I'd like you to give this to your therapist. I have these concerns. Or you might want to leave a message and say, I have some concerns. Would you give me a call back? Or you might want to say to your husband or wife, hey, can we go to therapy together? I have some things on my mind. In my, uh, just to say it, the work that we do, yes, it's personal. Yes, it's confidential. Yes, it's private. But if you have a concern about your husband or wife and you want to bring it up in a therapy setting and your husband and wife is in therapy, there is nothing wrong with your saying, I'm confused about some things. I'm a little concerned about it. I just want some help understanding the process you're in. Would you mind if I went and attended a session? That is perfectly healthy, perfectly okay. And any therapist uh, I think that does this work would understand that as a spouse, you might have concerns or feelings that you want addressed and they may not be coming up in session. So I would be very willing to have you come by once or twice. So to me, a spouse who comes into someone's therapy is a contributor or a cohort. They're offering better ways to help the person that I'm seeing. And I'm more than glad for their information. So um, I would not probably do it behind my husband or wife's back. I'd probably say, I'm going to leave a message with your therapist. These things are on my mind. Or will you bring this to them? Bring it back to me. Um, unless something's going on that's so heinous, like some full out affair or something that's really clear is not being talked about. Um, but you have many options. And I don't think any of them involve you're not communicating with the therapist. You, you should. So what about a sponsor? Because they also asked about a sponsor. Oh, I didn't hear that. Um, sorry. Uh, so okay. I'm read the questions. No, um, I'm asking. I, a sponsor is a different matter. Um, a sponsor is a very personal, well, actually, I have my own thoughts about it, but Tammy, what do you think? If well, my wife or boyfriend or girlfriend want to meet my sponsor, talk to my sponsor, or learn, you know, what would you say? I don't think I'd have a problem with them meeting them, but I don't think I want them going behind my back and talking to them. So, um, and I really think like you shared is more appropriate for the therapist. And then, you know, I, I, so I would rather keep those two things clean. I'd rather have it be, I'm going to, I want a session with your therapist, I, you know, and get a kind of, this is where we're at right now. And here's my concerns. You may be addressing these already. I don't see evidence of it, but you know, whatever. But I can share my feelings and thoughts. But but the it feels like I'm trying to control the whole situation if I'm running to the sponsor, especially behind a back. That's what it feels like. Um, and I, I would agree. I think the sponsorship relationship is a little bit different. It's so personal and so um, non-sexually intimate 
that um, I'm not sure, you know, that I would feel, I definitely wouldn't feel comfortable with my spouse calling my sponsor, but I can see leaving a message for a therapist, not talking to the therapist without me there, but saying I'd like to go to a session or something like that. Anyway, I think we've beat that, beat that horse. Next one. What comes first, uh, narcissism or sex addiction? Is there a st statistic? Well, let me say this. Um, so there's narcissists, someone who, has, who is a narcissist, it's a whole set of criteria. And then there are people who act narcissistically. And I would say to you that every addict acts narcissistically when they are in the throes of their addiction because when you are a drug addict, when you are a sex addict or a gambler, nothing matters to you except your relationship with the gambling or the drugs or whatever it is you're into. So you as a spouse come second, the family comes third, the work comes fourth. But the first thing is that relationship with the, with the addiction. Um, so, sorry, oh, I just hit the wrong button there. Whoops. Ah. <laughs> Tammy, I lost everything. Um, okay, let me go back to this. Hold on. I lost you guys. Hold on a second. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Look, look at the bottom for your little Zoom app. and you That's should what I needed. Thank you, yeah. Tammy. I knew. Sometimes I can be helpful. So. No, you're always what? helpful. Um, so uh, let me just say this a little bit more about that. So everyone who's an active addict looks narcissistic because we're completely self-invested in what we want and trying to keep the secret. In sobriety, those traits don't go away right away, um, but they're not necessarily related to an addiction. In other words, there are lots of people who are not narcissistic and also are addicts. Um, in sex addiction, we tend to see more narcissism and narcissistic wounds. I don't, you know, I, I think I would be curious how you look at the word narcissism and how you think about that whole concept, because, you know, it isn't necessarily the worst thing in the world. We all are, can be narcissistic. My concern is more, can someone take responsibility for their behavior? Can they be accountable for it? Um, I may act narcissistically and let you down or disappoint you or, or I probably have, but can I come back and say, you know, I did that. I want to own that. I was wrong. Cause that is the healing of narcissism. It's not that everyone's going to get it right, but that they can own their stuff, be accountable and um, look at their part. That means that they are stepping aside from their narcissism and willing to grow relationships. But yeah, every addict is somewhat narcissistic by nature, somewhat narcissistic in the uh, practice of our addiction. And I just want to address the statistic piece. I have a minor in statistics. So like I actually really geek off on statistics, but I find with this stuff, it really is not as helpful because you know like it doesn't really matter if your loved one falls into one category or another it's like they're still your loved one so you know you're dealing with this one person and not the hundred percent of people etc so so I would invite you to to look at it more on this person you know what's going on for this person and how can we help that person heal so okay next question what timeline should one have for their essay to get it to get it after getting sober. When do they actually develop empathy? We've done FTD, impact letter, and last week, restitution letter. I struggled with it. And with multiple polygraphs, when do they realize how painful this has been? And in the beginning of Out of the Doghouse, you did this, and what are you going to do about it? Well, everybody's different, right? And so, you know, within a week or two, I've seen clients feel incredibly of treatment, like inactive, like in treatment. I've seen clients in a very short period of time get to remorse, get to understanding of what they've done and immediately want to jump back and, and uh, take responsibility for it and clean things up even before they're ready. Um, on the other hand, I've had people in treatment a year or longer and they, they didn't make a lot of progress. So um, it really depends on who the person is, how defended they are, what their history is, you know, all of that. Um, so there isn't a timeline. It's kind of like Tammy with the last question. There really isn't a timeline. It's more about the individual but it sounds like you guys are going through a lot of hoops. And I have to say this, you know, getting much past the first polygraph or even to the second, like, you know, I'd, I'd stop the polygraphs. It's like, if you believe them or you don't, either it's working or it isn't. The, the facts on the ground shouldn't change. The, it's someone being honest with you, someone telling you their truth, someone taking being accountable, that shouldn't change. More polygraphs shouldn't be needed for that. Either the guy's dedicated to recovery or he's not. Um, the question I would have is when do you think you could ever trust or believe him again? Because would four polygraphs to it? Would five? Would it be three therapies? I mean, and I'm not trying to defend this person. I have no idea. They may be treating you terribly. 
but trust is a kind of a, it's kind of a difficult thing, you know, because spouses want to say, well, if the polygraph comes out, then I'll t- trust. Or if I read this report that the therapist said, I'll trust. Or if his sponsor tells me, and, you know, trust just doesn't work that way. You're not going to trust until you trust. And you will trust when it feels right to you in your gut to trust. And if you don't ever trust this person, maybe that relationship isn't going to work because trust is required to restore a relationship. And I will say this to you. And I'm not saying this to all the spouses and Lord spouses don't get too mad at me, but sometimes anger can be counterproductive. Sometimes I see couples get to the point after a year or two years of working on this and therapies and, you know, 12 step and polygraphs and couples there and retreats and workshops. It's like either you're at some point going to start to enjoy each other as a couple or you're not. And no amount of work is going to make that happen again. If you have joy in each other, regardless of the pain that has been been occurring, you should be able to find your way back to connection. And if you don't share joy and have never shared joy, then you're probably not going to share joy just because he or she stopped having sex with strangers. Um, Because it's about what you share together. Um, And I know I can forgive an awful lot of things to the person who is accountable, who is loving, and who's trying. But would I trust them right away or believe them right away? No. That wouldn't be healthy. But would I slowly begin to let them in a little bit emotionally? Absolutely. Um, So, you know, I can't answer these very difficult questions for you. Um, I know that it's easy to give up hope. Um, I will say to you, just to your question a little bit and to the question before you, we absolutely stop the addiction and the addictive behavior in our healing before our emotional awareness begins to grow. So me as a narcissistic person, that's going to take years of work. Me as a sex addict to just stop acting out, that can happen in a fairly short period of time. In other words, my stopping the behavior that's hurting you, that could happen fairly quickly with the right situation, right 12-step meeting, right therapy, whatever. But my being a better, good person who really shows you the love you deserve, that could take a long time. Next question. I am a member of an SAA group. I'm wondering your opinion on recovery without the need or use of higher power. For me, I see the power of fellowship. I see the power of connection and being vulnerable, but I don't think I believe in any kind of personal God that would save me. I do believe that there is a part of me that wants to thrive, and maybe that could be called a higher power. I believe that the mystery of the universe is powerful, and I hate that, and I can feel awkward contemplating that but how can I reconcile the concept of higher power and recovery when I don't know how to navigate it and what about prayer thank you great I love this I, question. it's a it's a great question so let's both answer it I, I yes I was like I'm, first go for it go for it so I have struggled with this issue for many many years because I'm not a, a practicing religious person and I wasn't brought up with a particularly religious background and that's what spirituality meant to me Um, was going somewhere and praying in that place in a particular way. Religion is what spirituality meant to me. But I have to tell you, and this is just me, the reason I'm in this profession now 25 years, the reason that I entered this profession, which was to save lives when HIV AIDS was killing people in the way that it was, um, all of that was predicated, I mean, what I've done for 25 years, and the reason I'm sitting here offering my time for free, is all based on something spiritual and meaningful to me, which is how I interpret it, which is when I see two people come together and talk about their problems, that's where I see God. When I see two people come together and healing and forgiveness and hope and connection, take that's where God is for me. Other people may need something outside of that, but all I know and all I need to know is that when people come together with a hope and belief and faith that they can support each other and heal, they heal. And that is enough proof to me that there are things bigger than myself out there. To me, it simply is those two or three people or that dozen people or there's 25 people or the 100 people sitting in a 12-step meeting. It's the connection that they all share in the room that you can't even see. To me, that is what spirituality is. So without having to accept a big G God, and I'm at one end of the spectrum, certainly, I've certainly been able to come, and I think a lot of people I work with, have been able to come to terms with a belief that they see healing, they see hope, they see change when we come together to support each other and when we are there for each other. And to me, if nothing else, that's G-O-D in action. So I believe in the process. And when I say the process, I don't just mean stopping sex addiction or being less narcissistic, or I believe in the whole process of human healing and the potential for us to, to truly recover who we might be 
but only in the presence of and in the connection with other caring, loving human beings. And if that's not where God is present, then I don't know where to find him. Uh, Tammy, you got a response? Yeah, well, I think you actually shared in your your message. I see the power of fellowship. I see the power of connection and being vulnerable. Right. You, you're talking, that's higher power. For me, my higher power was my addiction and everything was focused on that. It drove my life. And so, and I was raised in a, a religious environment um, and I had to completely turn that upside down. What the 12 mm -hmm. steps and recovery gave me was a personal higher power. Mark Anthony Lord did a series of webinars for us and there was one about this. And so I'd invite you to look on YouTube because it's there, but he talked about like getting rid of the, you know, of the, um, unhealthy higher power or God version that you had um, that was not working for you. And he gave us steps on finding a higher power that would be personal and work for us. So, so I would invite you to go look at that YouTube, but I think you already answered, you know, cause you do see the power of fellowship and the power of connection. That's higher power. That is that's you know, it. That's a great place. You already got it. Yep. Okay, next question. My SA husband uh, has been in recovery for 16 months from porn and compulsive masturbation. His behavior has changed recently with more resentment and lack of empathy for me and my triggers. I have been noticing in his underwear lately some yellow stains that I have not noticed before and I've done the laundry for 27 years. Do older men in SA recovery have random erections and leak semen? I worried that he has gone back to masturbating. I was vulnerable and asked him and he became defensive. Can you tell me what goes on for a man who is in recovery and dealing with daily stimulation at work? How old? Um, well, they've been um, married for 27 years, so He's let's, probably at least 45 or 50. Yes, let's say yeah, let's say it, yeah, 50 ish. So, can you tell me what goes on for a man who is recovering and dealing with daily stimulation at work? Should he be talking to me about this issue if he's having erections daily? I have controlled my sexual arousal to other people. Can men control arousal? That's okay, a that's lot a lot. Questions. Yes, um, let's start with. Uh, Physiology. So, okay, let me just say this. When I hear a spouse, and I'm not going to, I don't know you, don't know your story, don't know your husband, don't know your situation, but when I hear a spouse 63 say, 63 years old. When I hear a spouse say, my husband was doing really well in recovery and we were really getting on, but lately he seemed to be backing away, more irritable, pushing me away, defensive when I'm asking about the question, and I think he's having sex. I have evidence he's been having sex outside our relationship, whether himself or otherwise. I would trust that. I think that's enough for you to say, Something's not right here, and you seem to be doing better a few months ago, and I need to know what's going on. And, and this might be a situation where you say, I'd like to go into your therapy with you. If he's not in therapy, if he is, that would certainly be something to consider. Most people who enter these kinds of programs in the beginning, and I don't know how long he's been doing this, get a, little bit, get a little bit of a honeymoon, what we call the pink cloud. And oftentimes in the first couple of months, it's like, oh, thank goodness my secrets are gone and I have people to help me and I'm not doing all this crazy sexual stuff and I, my mood is lifted up and I feel less alone and it all goes away, meaning the desire to act out and the acting out. And suddenly we love our spouses and we're so grateful we have what we have and we're in our bodies and we're present. Unfortunately, that doesn't last. And that is the time when a lot of us really need to dig in and, and, and get that therapist, get into that group, start the work, which is a good two or three years worth of work once you start it, both therapy and 12 step in my opinion. Um, so, you know, if I didn't, if I knew you, if I did, if I knew you, I might say, you know, well, I wonder if your husband's sober because what you're describing is typical relapse behavior, backing away from you, being less honest and all of that. And especially the defensiveness. So this is something I really don't like. When addicts, we, we lose, I believe that when we start lying and being unaccountable, we lose the right to be defensive. You know, if I'm being honest with you, if I'm, if I'm telling Tammy, look, Tammy, I turned in the work keys this morning at nine o'clock. I'm sure I did. Um, you know, I think that, and I really did return them. When Tammy calls me and says, I wear those keys, I, I could see my saying, gosh darn it, I, I put those keys in the box. But if I know I didn't put the keys in the box and Tammy calls me and says, where are the keys? I better not say, well, you should look harder because I don't know where they are. You know, I need to say, hey, you know, sometimes I forget. Maybe I forgot this time. In other words, I don't think you should ever be met with defensiveness at this point. 16 months in, if nothing else, 
if my husband or wife looked at me and said, I'm really concerned about your addiction, I would probably feel ashamed, look down, say, wow, I, I wonder why you're feeling bad or what am I, I my guess is he's hiding something. <laughs> I'm sorry to tell you that because he should be more open. I mean, as we move forward, we get more open, more available, more honest, more kind, not less. So, um, you know, I, I think you should trust your gut. And I think you're asking me this question because you already know the answer. And no, I don't think we stop acting out because we get 16. Or okay, seven. correct. So I was, so this is from um, a male. I was really affected by my mom's sexual behavior. After listening to all your podcasts and reading some of your books, I feel like she might be a sex and love addict in serious denial. I also feel absorbed by some of her patterns by osmosis, but I don't feel like a sex addict, more like a love addict maybe. I'm a guy who's been going to SLAA and SCA groups. I am attracted to both men and women but mostly men and mostly looking for love and intimacy and not just sex. I relate more to the possibility of being a love addict, but I have felt like I've been fake being a sex addict to fit into the meetings. As a guy, I feel weird as a male love addict, but again, I don't know if I'm an addict. I feel like I'm trying to understand my mom and her behaviors by studying all this material. Any insights based on all this rambling? Any tips for men that are more love addicted than sex addicted? A big issue for me is that sex addicts pursue me especially now that I'm in good shape, they want sex, I want intimacy. And are you having sex or are you getting intimacy? I just wanted to ask that. Um, so I wanted to, uh, this is a great question. Um, a couple of things. Um, I don't know what you mean by your mom's behavior and being and absorbed by it, but I do know what it means to most of the clients that Tammy and I deal with. And um, it relates to this idea of maternal enmeshment that, many of the men that we work with have had histories where they were kind of overly tied up in mom's personal life or emotional life in ways that don't serve us as adults. And while, while it might not have been incest so much like in the physical sense, it can also often rob us of our own sense of self in early life. And so mother and meshed boys are very frequently showing up in sex addiction treatment. Um, I have a really good colleague, Ken Adams, who wrote a book called Silently Seduced and another book called Married to Mom. And these are both titles that I think fit into that idea. And I would recommend reading Silently Seduced or Married to Mom to get a sense of that whole maternal relationship and what it might have meant. Um, the other thing I would really recommend you read is read, go online and buy the Sex and Love Addicts big book. Um, it just says it's called Sex and Love Addicts. It has a little uh, pink and blue and red rainbow on it. And the reason that I recommend this, so this is the book they use in those meetings. And the reason I recommend it is, is I've read it many times and the SLAA big book, Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous, SLAA, not Sex Addicts Anonymous, Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous. They have a lot of stories about men who are love addicted and a lot of stories where men are talking about being with this woman and being with that woman and not knowing which to be with. And then I'm with this woman and I'm with, so I'm glad you read both. Um, that's where the answers are. Um, so hopefully those things are helpful to you. And for those who have not read both, I really love the SLA big book because I think if you're a man and you can't understand love addiction for yourself because you feel like all the other guys are sex addicts, I feel like the SLAA big book does really give you a clue about um, how that works for men. Um, and yeah, so that's that. Okay. Next question. And by the way, let me say one more thing, this gentleman, because he keeps chatting us. Um, when we really need to talk is when you start dating, because then you need a dating plan, a dating support, a dating posse. You're a single guy. You want to start going out. You're taking a year off. I would be sure that you fill that year up with activities that make you feel like you are getting to know yourself better, that you're getting to be creative and enjoying yourself, because the more of you that there is to bring into any relationship that shows up, the better. And here's, if you're not dating and you're not having sex, what a great time to start hobbies, to work on your education, your house, your creativity, so that you're more of a person than you were when you were in the dating pool last time. Yeah. What else we got, Tim? Next question. What is your opinion on informing my spouse's long-term sex partner's spouse about my spouse's infidelity with their spouse? So basically I want to tell I the other it. person. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. How many ways, how many ways can I say no? Yeah. <laughs> um, so what you're doing is called, um, I don't know, emotional blackmail or um, raging, you know, raging at the wrong person for the wrong reasons. I mean, so whatever this person did and whatever they don't do, or it really has nothing to do with you. It's between you and your spouse. And I, 
always get concerned when people want to spill their anger and disappointment out into other people's lives. I don't care if this woman ruined your life by sleeping with your husband. That's on her and her marriage. You have your own issues with you and your marriage that need to be addressed. And if this woman is still engaged with your husband, that's your husband's problem. How does he cut her off? How does he stay away? How does he not get involved? But um, I really feel strongly that um, if you want to make recovery more difficult for you and your husband, start calling his exes up and telling him that you know everything. Um, that could slow things down for a year or more. Um, I don't, because it sounds, I know what the word is, revenge or vengeful is what that sounds like. And, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm not God. I don't get to throw lightning bolts at people and tell them how their lives should be improved. Uh, I only get to improve my life and the lives of the people around me. And, you know, uh, I would consider if you have a, um, if you have a spiritual background, I would pray for this woman. That's what we often say. Wish her your best, your best prayers and wishes for her happiness, because um, hopefully she will heal, heal her own wounds as you will yours. But I don't think you're getting involved with other troubled people's marriages and lives is really going to help you at all. Yeah, and and I would invite you to think about if you got a phone call from somebody. Right. Yeah, like how how would you feel? I mean, that's. You know, and what would you there's do? another in, innocent person, so presumably you're, you're if you know, if Her male, husband female, or whatever. whatever, yeah, I mean, whatever it is, I mean, there, there's someone else who's been betrayed as well, and um, you know, it, it's a tough situation, and I agree with Rob, like, like just working on your your situation is probably big enough to deal with right now. And and I want you to know that you have every right to be incredibly angry. Absolutely. And you get to be angry with everybody in your life who supports you as long as it isn't someone who has been involved with him romantically or sexually or someone who you will regret later having told. You know, you may not want to tell your mother, you may not want to tell your sister because you got to face those people at Thanksgiving and 3 years from now when this is passed, you know, but but I don't think running to affair partners is anything but T-R-O-U-B-L-E. Oh, a little Travis truth there. Okay. What should I expect for a treatment plan from a CSAT therapist? I know it's individual, but is a plan written out? Can you explain it? Well, that's a great question. I think every, everyone who goes to therapy should have a treatment plan. And we are required to sit down with you live and write down a, a little list, if you ask, these are the things we're going to work on. Do you agree? Do I agree? In fact, some of the best therapy, I write it down, you sign it, I sign it. And then in a couple of weeks, we look and we say, how are we doing with our goals? Are we achieving them? So I think having clear written goals for you and your therapist are extremely important. Um, and I'm sorry, what was the rest of that question, Tammy? It oh, said, um, go ahead. Related to sex addiction. Um, so I can just tell you what I think the plan is for any sex addicts coming to treatment. Number one, um, my first thing I'm trying to figure out is, are they motivated? And what is their motivation? Because if somebody's really ready to move and ready to get well and wants to, then I know the steps that we need to take. But it's not unusual for someone to come into our office and they're just there for their wife. They're not really there for them at all. And they really don't want to work. And we start working with them, they back away. And so the first answer to your question is, is the person in treatment ready to be there and ready to work? And you know that's different than somebody who, are, a lot of people come in, what I would call pre-treatment. And it's gonna be a lot longer for them before they get a sense of what they've done, motivation. So treatment plans vary from person to person. And for you individually, how much therapy you had in the past, how much 12-step have you had in the past, you know, what kind of support systems do you have? All of that are gonna feed into what goes on your treatment plan. But primary, primary things on a sex addiction treatment plan are, Identify the problem behavior, stop the problem behavior, identify all triggers to the problem behavior, and then begin to look underneath and deal with the crisis around the family, everything's going on, get the person plugged into social support, um, and then somewhere down the line, uh, maybe if you stick around for treatment and therapy six months to a year later, start looking at trauma and underlying issues. So it kind of goes like that. Next question. Um, I'm considering, re this is from a female, I'm considering rekindling with an ex-intimate partner from Iraq when we were fighting in the war 15 years ago. He reached out to me. I've always wondered about him through the years. He is now rich. I am not, but fiercely independent and okay financially. He is going through a divorce. Question, I do not know this man outside of a highly stressful zone. We had a crazy love story. 
Um, I'm curious who he is now. One of my boundaries is not going out with married men. So I would wait for the divorce. Men with money make me nervous. How do I navigate all this? I do not accept any gifts at all or invitations. I know that much. Thanks. Well, I guess I'm, I was reading along with Tammy because when I read, I am considering rekindling. I'm thinking, what does that mean? I mean, have you spoken to each other? Have you interacted with each other? Is this out of the blue? Do you know why he's getting a divorce? Is it because he's found someone else? Or is it because he's just unhappy? I think there's more here than probably we know about. But um, um, I think it's perfectly appropriate if you're single and he's single at some point to start chatting with each other and seeing how that goes. I would hold off on the sex. I would hold off on, you know, what made it all intense and amazing may not, see, here's the thing, when you're at war or in some kind of super situation like that, everything seems amazing. Everything seems intense because, you know, you might die in five minutes, you might get caught, you know, who knows what's gonna happen. So the question really is, who are the two of you together when you're sitting over coffee and you're not at war, when you're watching a TV show, when you're going for a walk, who are the two of you getting to know each other without the sexuality, without the intensity, that would tell me a lot. I would also say to you that while many men, in my experience, sadly do go from a broken relationship right into marriage with someone else, um, it would really, it's really always useful to take some time out in between relationships. And so the idea that this man, for whatever reason, might be divorcing, that's not an easy situation to go through. I mean, he's got to deal with divorce, he's got to deal with kids, if that's going on. He's got to deal with money and finances and housing. And, you know, divorce is a major up there with death and birth. So I'm not sure that this man would be ready to date you or ready to date anyone, you know, for a good few months until after he's divorced. Um, there's nothing wrong with saying, I remember you and I still have an interest in you, but I probably wouldn't pursue it while a divorce is ongoing. I also would ask, is he still living with his wife right now? Because if he is, then I wouldn't be contacting him at all because I wouldn't want to talk to someone who's still living with their married partner and still working on a marriage. Remember that all kinds of people say all kinds of things about getting divorced, going to get divorced, want to get divorced. I don't believe it until I see the piece of paper. So I'm a little suspicious that way. I don't blame you. And the other thing I think is interesting, men with money make me nervous. And I, I would invite you to explore what all that's about because men with money make you nervous men with no money should make you nervous so right. it's like you know so like uh, maybe but, men make you nervous yeah exactly <laughs> what dollar amount is going to work so okay next question can you give an example of a good dating plan sure um i create something called a, a traffic light plan for dating and if you think of a traffic light it has a green light that means go right and has a yellow light that means warning or if you're like me, go a little faster so you can get through the light. Um, shh, I don't know what I know, and I then laugh. the red light is, you know, you know what a red light is. So this is how it works. Before I date, before I meet anybody I might date, I sit and I write out, what are my red lights? If I, if I met you tonight for a date, what would be the things that would tell me I absolutely do not want to go out with you again? So, you know, let I'll give some extreme examples. So red lights are things like I, the person is married. The person is actively using drugs. Uh, the person doesn't have a job. The person doesn't have a place to live and lives with their mother. I mean, for me, these might be red lights for you. They may not be, but whatever your red lights are, meaning things that you know have gotten you in trouble in the past or you just heck know is not a good idea, like dating someone 30 years older than you or whatever it is. And you put your red lights in there and then you go to yellow lights. And you think, hmm, of all the people I've dated, when, I, when I've dated and knowing myself, what are some warning signs that somebody might not be someone good to date? Oh, they don't laugh at my jokes. Oh, they smoke cigarettes and I don't like smoking. Oh, they, um, they talk about themselves a lot and don't seem to ask me about me. They don't return my phone calls. You know, these are things that, you know, maybe they'll laugh at a joke next time or maybe they'll call your, return your call next week. So you're not really sure, but it's definitely a warning sign. And then your green lights are, you know, we get along, we have fun together, our, our friends enjoy each other, our kids like each, you know, and you got to get all of the things and we're both professionals, whatever it is. So that there's a reason for this. The reason for the plan is not just to know what you're doing when you're dating. It's so that when you get into the wonky, oh, they're so cute and beautiful and I love dating, which what happens to us, we get a little emotional sometimes when dating and we stop seeing people clearly. And suddenly that person who's really not the right person for us to date is looking really, really good because we've opened ourselves up to the possibility that they might meet our needs and they seem very nice. And we just forget that they're a heroin user who's married and doesn't have a car. You know, we just think they're really adorable. And that's when you take that list 
and that date and you go back to your sponsor or the people in your program and you say, hey, I just went on a nice date with someone who I think is wonderful and I want to marry and I want to spend the rest of my life with. I've just met him once and he's a heroin addict and he's married. And that's when the people in your life say, well, let me look at that red light list. I think active drug addiction and married were no's. So you don't get to date that person again. And here's the thing, you don't. Because in this situation, we don't make the decisions about whether we go out with people again or how often the people who know us best do. Because we are not, we are not very good at making decisions around dating or sex. But the people who, who know our struggle, who've been there to see us get through it, they know. And the person who knows your dating plan, and you've already gone through it with them, knows that you're going on a date tonight because you've checked it out with them, will want to go talk to you after the date to make sure that that person met your criteria or didn't. Is it okay to have criteria for dating? Absolutely. Is it too picky? Absolutely not. Are some criteria maybe changeable and some not? Sure. Um, my, I had criteria I was never to date anyone who was within 10 year, uh, older or younger than 10 years. That was my criteria. I married someone who is 12 years younger than me, and we've been married for 18 years. So was that the right criteria? No, um, but that was a, a one I could negotiate. I wasn't supposed to date someone who lived in another city, but I did. And then I went back to the folks and they were like, oh, that's okay. My sponsor said fine. My therapist said fine. In fact, toward the end, and this might be interesting to you, um, as I started to get really interested in dating a particular person, I would go to my sponsor, my therapist, and tell them all the reasons why I shouldn't keep dating that person because we're intimacy avoidant. And I kept saying, oh, oh, but they're too young. Oh, oh, but they live in another place. Oh, and my sponsor, my therapist were like, so what? You need to keep dating them. So having these people in my life and having a plan doesn't only keep me away from the people who are problematic. It also draws me toward the people who are right for me because we will often overlook the uh, person who doesn't have the intensity or the sparkle or that magic in the first glance. But if we get encouragement to keep getting to know them, you never know what's going to happen. And um, by the way, there's a great book on dating called If the Buddha Dated by a friend of mine named Dr. Charlotte Castle, K-A-S-L. She followed it up by a book called If the Buddha Married. And they're both books on spiritual dating and spiritual marriage. And I think they, they do a really good job of describing that process. That was a great answer and great examples. So, and That's we don't have any more. We don't have any more questions. So, yes, we oh, wait, so we just do. So, uh, I am feeling fear since you gave me your response. What do I say to my husband when he comes home? Okay, I got to go back and look at which. I think this um, has to do with uh, my husband's underwear has been dirty and his, uh, and, I, and he's been yes, irritable. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's sixteen months of recovery. And um, I know what I would, I, I can make the strongest recommendation to you possible. And I know it's the right recommendation because I know it is. Don't do anything. Find the next spouses drop in group that we have. And Tammy's going to tell you when it is and sit with some of the other spouses here in a space like this. So we have a drop in group for women who've been betrayed by men. There's no men in the room. <laughs> it's all ladies who've experienced this. We also have rooms for men who've been betrayed by women, but in this particular room and Tammy's going to type it and send it in the chat, just sit there and talk. Like the best place for you to go with these fears and concerns is to other women who are experiencing the same thing. The truth is, I don't know you. I'm not with you. Your fears may be overblown. Um, you know, he may have spilled some milk on his pants. I don't know what happened. So I don't want to tell you he's lying. He's not. But I will tell you the best thing of all, which is if you turn to peers and you get the support of other women who are going through what you're going through and you get their advice and their feedback, you're going to be far ahead of the game than by talking to him. Um, I would absolutely recommend strongly you check in with those other women first, L listen what they have to say, ask the question about what you're struggling with. Maybe one of them will help you. And here's a good idea. Maybe the, the group decides that you should talk to your husband. Great. But maybe one of those ladies you meet on the group will say, call me after and we can chat. Just to have that support is everything, I promise. Thanks, Tim. So, so um, going back to the dating Online dating should not be on the dating plan. Oh, I didn't say online dating should be on your dating plan. Everybody makes it, gets to make their own dating plan. If your first date was online, great. Then you get to hang up and call your sponsor or your therapist. Say, I just had this first date and this is who I met. And, but online is the way the world works. I don't think anybody can. It's very hard to meet people not online these days. So I wouldn't rule that out. I would, however, not engage in online dating without 
the oversight of somebody in recovery who's helping me because clicking on, does someone want me? Does someone want me? Does someone want me? Can quickly turn into, I want to go have sex. I want to go have sex. I want to go have sex. And so, um, you know, that kind of compulsive looking for a person, it all, bl it all blends together in our heads. By the way, I want to say that there are, for those of you who are interested, um, there are, there is software out there that provides tracking. And I really like tracking software. What tracking software does is it doesn't block you from anything. But once you put it on your computer, everything you, every keystroke you use both on your computer or on your phone will go to a sponsor or a therapist. You can send that to anyone you want. In other words, you can do whatever you want on your phone. You can do whatever you want on your computer, but someone's going to find out. And you're going to have to talk to them about it, someone like a sponsor or a therapist. And so my point is, is that your accountability online is what matters. And, and even when you're dating, you know, you could spend an hour on a dating site, but all that information maybe gets sent to your sponsor or your support person, and then you can talk about it. It's not a secret. Um, if, however, you spend four hours on the dating website, that would begin to feel compulsive and problematic. And someone would notice that and say, gee, uh, I think we need to talk about that. Um, but yeah, online dating, sure. Online dating, taking your clothes off, no. So do you want to answer the top one by text, by typing the answer, and I'll answer the bottom one by answering it? <laughs> no, Tammy, you can go ahead and answer that question. You answer the first one. Go ahead. Um, I'm chewing gum. I'm only chewing gum when I'm doing this. Um, go ahead. Tell them why we look great, Tammy. It, Rob, your skin is glowing. What is your skin regimen, cream, <laughs> skin sauna? <sighs> Is your skin, not mine. Yours is. You're also glowing, though. Well, so, you, you do have, no, you look particularly great. Okay, so for, first of all, I'm sitting in the afternoon light. So Southern California sun is streaming me in on me with filters from this. So I, this is the best light you can ever get. And number two is, Tammy and I have a secret, and I can give it to you. It's a beauty that secret. You can do, yeah. Um, if you go into preferences under Zoom, and you look under preferences, and you actually get it to the advanced stuff, there's a little button that you click toward smoothing my complexion, I think is what it's called. And it just kind of makes all of those little dots and it just makes it all go away. It smooths you. So here I am. I, you may think I look great. I think I look smooth. But in any case, um, it's not me. It's, it's the technology. And you too can look better than you do. Just click that button. <laughs> it does help, but you're, you, do, you do have a glow today. So, okay. So the next question is, what if you want to just have sex with someone with red light stuff? Would you always recommend not? Uh, whoa. I know. I was like. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Well, it depends on why you're here. I mean, if you're here because you want to have meaning in your life, you want to have intimacy in your life, you don't like the way you've been throwing yourself away or you've been used, then I don't know that having sex with anybody who has red light stuff is a particularly good idea. See, here's the thing, you know, well, first of all, if you're a woman, well, let me forget being a woman. We bond somewhat to the people we're sexual with. That's part of life. So do you really want to bond to someone who's a heroin addict and doesn't have a car and is married? And by the way, do you really want to participate in that person cheating on their marriage? Or if they're not sober, maybe something that happened between you leads them running into the streets looking for drugs. I mean, I just want to be, I want healthy people around me in my recovery. I want people who are clear headed and kind and working on themselves and can own their shit. And I don't care whether that's in bed or the post office. So no, I wouldn't want unhealthy people in my bed. I don't care how cute they are or how hot the sex is because I don't want to be unhealthy. Um, and that's where I end up with unhealthy people in my bed. Yeah. And thank And yes, skin glowing. Yes, that's true. Okay. <laughs> I don't like to use apps to meet people. Tips on how to meet people not online. So I just want to tell you the reality of where we are in the world. And I don't know how old you are, but I was in New York not that long ago on a book tour. And um, I think it was out of the doghouse, actually. And I was sitting in a magazine editorial room with a bunch of women. And there were about six women. And they were all women editors at this magazine in New York. And they were like career women, you know, they'd been to college, they were living forward of an apartment in New York, and they were, you know, working and trying to get ahead. And I asked them how dating was going. And one of the women said, well, it's interesting you asked because we've decided to have app, an app-free month, an app-free month for their website. And I said, why do you have an app-free month for your viewers and readers and stuff? And she said, because... All six of us have sat together as women under 35 in New York City, and we realized that none of us have been on a, been on a date 
where we didn't meet someone on an app. So what I'm saying to you is I met six healthy women, in, I think reasonably healthy, busy women in New York City, and none of them have ever been asked out at a party. None of them have ever been asked out at a restaurant. None of them ever, ever went up to someone at Starbucks, according to them. And what that means to me is that a lot of people are, are not meeting up to date. The vast majority of people are meeting up on apps and online. And so I give this to you with two pieces. Here's the two pieces. One, sometimes you got to do things you don't like to meet people for dating. And it may be that you need to drag your butt online and do some online dating, whether you like it or not. And I'm not talking about sex apps. I'm talking about dating, you know, uh, the harmony type things where you're looking for a, a partner. The other thing is that if you want to be old school, and I certainly understand the desire to be old school, meet people who you might want to date live, then you have to be out there. You know, if you're going to want to meet people to date, and I assume the workplace is usually not a good place to meet people, then you got to be on a team. You better be in a choir. You got to be volunteering for that, you know, uh, for that um, church social, or you have to be out there in situations where you are going to be meeting people. You have to let every friend you know that you're looking to date. You have to create an environment of availability for yourself. Being online in the apps and all, that does it already for you because if you're there, you're looking to date and it says all about who you are and what you're looking for. If you're not wanting to go that route, then you have to create old timey environments where you're gonna meet people and you know what? The people you meet may not even be the people you date. Tammy and I often talking about this, it's maybe going to those environments and you'll meet somebody who becomes a friend and that friend maybe knows somebody you might date. So it's by putting yourself out there, really being in the world and living in your living your life, but actively being aware and letting people know that you're looking, that you're going to find somebody. And by the way, just to all of you folks who think, oh, well, I think what you're supposed to do is never look for someone until they find you. I'm not a party of that game. You can sit alone the rest of your life. Uh, dating is a numbers game. You have to date a lot of people to find the right person. Most of us give up far too early. Next so year. for those, well, I'm going to tag on. So okay. for those of you that are in recovery, um, and I was trying to find it quick while um, you were talking, but there is a recovery app for dating. So if you want to meet other recovering people, so you have that foundation, um, email me and I'll, I'm, I will find it by tomorrow and um, be able to connect you with that. But um, that's one platform that you could use and not all apps are the same. I mean, some of them are totally hookup things, but you know, um, I know people that have asked friends and they've directed them to, well, this app is more like this, you know, so it, you can pick an app. There's a zillion of them, but yeah, I mean, otherwise, you know, I, I like to hike, so I would join a hiking club, you know? You know, so, I hear Tammy likes to dance, and she like and her husband dance. go dancing uh, do. and take dancing lessons, but I bet there are singles dancing evenings when you can go find another partner and that you're just dancing with someone and getting to know them. I mean, yes. what a fun thing to do. Yes, so, and you're having fun regardless of whether you meet someone, but you might know fun, somebody. And you're having fun doing something you like, which means oh. if that person's there, that's probably something they like, so you already have something in common. Exactly. We want to see you married, Tammy and I, honest, we do. Absolutely to healthy people. Okay, I'm an SLAA female, although I don't, or all, wait, although I get what you're saying about avoiding the red lights, but I feel like such a peasant when half of my girlfriends are totally about using guys for things and just separate feelings from the experience and walk away. The other half of my girlfriends are super strong and giving and end up getting cheated on. Is this all an illusion? Are we all fooling ourselves? I was never able to use a guy for vacations and jewelry and wonder if I should have rolled with it a few times. Well, I'm not sure what to say. So I do think that cultural definitions have changed. Um, I have a niece who took a couple of thousand dollar gift from some male friend and I thought, oh my God, I never would have done that. And that's, it makes me think she's a big hoe. Um, she didn't feel very good when I told her that, but um, I do think there are some generational things going on, Tammy, honestly, where there's a lot more gift giving going on male to female than we had when we were growing up. And I do think that there's a lot more women who are out there as takers um, in that way. And I see it, you know, and I hear about it and I hear guys upset about it. But so I don't, you know, to, to the degree that I can possible, um, I don't know what it means to be a peasant, <laughs> but I think what you're saying is like, I don't feel like I'm the cool chick who gets all the fun stuff from the hot guys. You know what? Good for you. I don't think all those cool chicks are so happy. I don't think they look at that ring and that watch every time and feel a sense of self-esteem and love. 
Um, now, if you want to get a Rolex on your wrist by sleeping with some guy and you think you're going to feel good about it the next day, and you might, go for it if that's what you want. But if you want intimacy, relationship, connection, and meaning, you're not going to find it going down that route. And, and I have to tell you, you know, if you're like many of us, when we get gifts, it's really hard to take them because we don't feel like we deserve them or we don't feel like we're worthy. And so taking gifts just for the sake of taking gifts kind of makes that worse. Um, I can't tell you what an amazing experience it is when someone I re who I really think cares about me acknowledges it. And it could be a note, it could be a card, it could be a little gift. I'm going to treasure that forever. But somebody who doesn't care much about me and is just giving me something expensive, well, I might take it, I might not. But what does that do for who I am as a person or my self-esteem? Not much. And by the way, sister, get your butt out there and buy yourself whatever you want. Work harder, get out there, and you don't need a man to do anything for you. And these women are bullshit. On one side, they're talking about equality, and then the other side, they're like, what can I get from a guy? It doesn't work that way. So go out there and make it for yourself, is what I say. And you'll enjoy it more. <laughs> right. And and because I think there's a steep cost to it. So while they, I, and, and it's generational and I'm clearly of the older generation, but I have um, been observing and I kind of wonder, you know, these, these young women who are acting more male and aggressive Players. and things like that. Yeah. And at the end of the day, you know, or 10 years from now or whatever, are they going to look back and go, gosh, that was a lot of fun. And they might. I think it's going to be a research project or are they going to go, wow, you know, I, I wish I had connected with people in a meaningful way. Um, who knows what it's going to say, but I think the truth is for you, what the truth is for you. And regardless of what right. girls on one side or the other are saying, what, what's going to feel like integrity for you. Right. And if you think that, you know, getting some guy to give you an expensive ring is going to make you feel better, try it out. Great. Um, I, I, I would suggest probably not. But I understand what I do understand what you said is how easy it is to look at other people and think, gosh, it's easy for them to take things and enjoy the ride. Why can't I? And maybe you just have a, you have a really solid heart and you're not willing to be accepted at that level. Although it looks really good. It's not you. And I would say you get a big gold star for me for that. And I think what you just said, too, about the illusion of, you know, it's like everybody looks at what's posted on Facebook and goes, gosh, everybody else on the planet has a happy life, you know. Well, they're not posting the, the not fun things, you know. They're only posting the happy memories, so. Um, I have never, uh, there's a saying a friend of mine said very long ago, which is those who play must pay. And if you're going to play with fire, you're going to get burned in one way or the other. You're not going to get a watch for free. I guarantee it. There will always be a cost to your self-esteem or your self-worth or your future, or you'll pay for it somehow. But go ahead. Have fun. The, uh, the intimacy I have experienced has been manipulated by my whole life. How do I know true intimacy versus being used? Female sex and love addict. This is a great question. Mm -hmm. So well, it depends on what you consider intimacy to be. Um, to me, you cannot manipulate intimacy because intimacy, so you can be manipulated sexually, you can be manipulated romantically, but intimacy is being known and accepted in love for who you are. If I reveal myself to you and I let you know all my vulnerabilities, all my secret thoughts, all my struggles, and you say, you know, that must be hard to be you, but I love you. I love the good, the bad, and the ugly. Then I, we're really intimate because you know me and I don't have any secrets from you and I am known. And it has been being known and accepted in love that intimacy shows up. So, and it can show up in little bits and, piece, bits and pieces. You know, if I say to you, and we're starting to date, like I had a rough childhood, and you say, oh, what was that about? And I tell you a little bit. Maybe we get a little bit more intimate. The next week you tell me you had a rough childhood, and we talk a little, or whatever the issue is. But my point is, is that, um, and oh, I wanted to say something else to you. Um, intimacy is not confined to, intimacy is not confined to sex and dating. I would say, you know, and what I say often to women in these rooms is, do you have a couple of women in your life who are not sexual with you, who are supportive and nurturing, who you can turn to and work on these issues? That's where you start to find intimacy, not with someone you might be sexual with, but with friends. You know, it's, I have a client in treatment. So some of you know, we, we run a treatment center and in the process of several actually. So I'm running treatment right now here in LA and um, I have, I'm working with somebody who, um, I want to just say something about this question that you're asking. Um, well, I guess, I guess the whole question is this. If you're trying to figure out what the intimacy is, 
Um, start with people with whom you feel safe and work your way out. Um, and you will get an experience of what that is. And really it is just going to someone close to you and telling them a little bit more about you. And if they respond well, telling them a little bit more and then they tell you a little bit more. I have some incredibly intimate friends who I've loved my whole life. We've never had sex. Um, I'm not interested, neither are they, but boy, are we intimate friends. I can pick up the phone with one of them anytime, three years out, and we're right on target with our relationship. Um, and Tammy knows what that's like. And those are the people that you need to feel loved by, because when love doesn't go well and dating doesn't go well, those are the people you need around to turn to, and they'll have your back. And you can have sex and not be intimate. Oh, well, welcome to the rooms, this room. Right, but when, when it's always, ex when, when the thought is that if I have sex, I'm intimate, you can have sex and not be intimate. Well, if your goal in being sexual is in part to reveal yourself emotionally and physically to someone, then you're being intimate. If you're just trying to get off or just trying to get something from them or, you know, that's not intimate. And people have non-intimate sex all the time. It's like a good workout. Tammy likes to go to, Tammy, uh, I don't want to reveal too much of you, but Tammy does a lot of working out and a lot of really solid exercise. And I know people who will go have sex like a good workout and they're not sex addicts. They just enjoy having sex with a stranger case or whatever they do, the FWB, friend with benefits. It doesn't have a lot of meaning to them. It's fun and their body feels satisfied and they got a few hugs and they're done. Nothing wrong with that unless what you're seeking is love, relationship, connection, and meaning. And you're not going to get that with casual sex. So that's the end of the question. No, we have more. Oh, we did it? No, oh. no, that was the two combined. So all right, well, let me just say one more thing before we stop. First of all, thank you all for being here. It is such a, a gift and an honor to be able to volunteer and offer this to you. Um, I want you to know if you have questions about the work we're doing. Um, Tammy is Tammy at SeekingIntegrity.com. I'm Rob at SeekingIntegrity.com. Um, we have drop-in groups all week long for female spouses, male spouses, professionals, uh, male addicts, female addicts, we cover the gamut and it's all at no cost. I also want to tell you that I have uh, what I, I think is a pretty good podcast. It's been going really well called Sex, Love and Addiction. We've had somewhere around 60,000 downloads. We have some really amazing, I think, experts in the field of intimacy, relationships and attachment who are coming to me from all over the world to do podcasts. And I hope you join us. It's another free way of getting information and support. Hey, Tammy, thank you for your support this week, this evening. Thank you as always. Great. You want to, we're going to stop. We want to stop. Okay. I will see you. I'll see you soon. Thank you for your help. And Come folks, back next week. And there's, there's a, so female sex and love addicts. There's a meeting Tuesday night, a drop in support group. So please join that. Um, there's a male partner group. There's all kinds of stuff on, Sex and relationship healing .com. Uh, I want to answer this question though. Okay. This woman's asking, she's looking, if she, she's a female sex addict. She wants to have male friends. Find some gay ones. They'll be great friends. I don't think as a female sex addict, you're probably going to want to line up for having a lot of straight male friends right away. And I'll Nor tell you. Or will their partners be real happy to have you have them as. Uh, and it's really, here's what you need to get that you're not getting. You need more women in your life. The, the key to women's recovery in sex and love addiction is the support of other women. I'm certain of it. I know that women on this planet, when you struggle with men, you talk to each other about us. That's how you get through it. You don't talk to the man, you talk to each other. And as my dear friend, Dr. Stan Tatkin would say, even women who are in the wildest regions of the world beating their laundry on rocks are sitting there complaining about their men. You need each other to survive us we're a train wreck each other if you just turn to us you're going to struggle a woman a healthy woman should have strong healthy female relationships all of her life in order to get through parenting husbanding childing all of it um and i hope that you go find those because those should be deeply intimate and very important and the female friends should be first and gay male second maybe but yeah. Well, I mean, no, well yes. No. yes. Female yeah, friends first. Yeah, you need females because you females need, learn the need to yes. relate with females. And it's really easy to go, well, I just don't get along. There's a reason you don't get along with females. That's right. Because they're competition. So. Well, and there are, and, and there are mother wounds and there's all yeah, kinds of reasons. All kinds but of stuff. But the, trust me, those of you who are listening, if you want to have a meaningful relationship and you're a single woman, start with a couple of really solid girlfriends and go from there. We actually say start with a plant. You can keep the plant alive maybe a pet, but I'm moving right to friends. Yes, I agree. Have a great evening, okay. guys. Thank you, Tammy, for your time. Bye. Bye for now.